Welcome to the No Fear Podcast and the No Fear Live Broadcast. I'm your host, Tony Lauer. If you're into mindset training, performance psychology, personal development, you'll dig this new format. No Fear Live is a unique broadcast and it's different from the No Fear Podcast. We decided to go live because we wanted to create the opportunity to interact with people like you all over the world where anyone can log in and ask questions and in some cases, you may even get invited into the show. The great thing about the live broadcast is that it's much more personal for the listener. That's you. Remember, self-defense isn't always about a confrontation with someone else. The first and most important fight is winning the one inside your head. Hey guys, it's me, and I am alone right now, although I got Elisa in the background, and we've got some some videos to show you. I think Jeff is having some technical difficulties. Oh, he just logged in here. This is great. Hang on a second. Dude, are you there? There we go. Can you hear me? I can see me. Nice. Did you take your tooth out just to prove you're a hockey player right now? (laughs) No, I actually, uh, I don't have a permanent one in, man. I had, I had one, I had three different ones in my last couple of years playing. They kept getting knocked out. So finally I was like, fuck it. I'm writing dirty. Right. Or is it just, you did a Sharpie on the tooth there. Is it really <laughs> missing? Dude. It's so good. So good to, uh, uh, how are we, how are we, how are we doing there? You can hear me. I can hear you through my computer. Okay. I'm trying to get the audio. I've never used this, um, set up. A little yeah. louder. Do you know where the audio button is by any chance for if you're using a microphone? Um, no, that would be software on your side. Here it goes. Settings. Okay. Audio right here. Um, Master speakers. Uh, sure. Okay. Got it. There you go. Boom. I saw it. Are you, yeah. Yeah. You're okay. fine. Are you, uh, is that your, is that your gym? Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah, this is my gym. I have uh, my first group today for off season, the youngest group I train that's still in St. Louis right now. So uh, I just figured I would do it here from here instead of my home office. Yeah. Are you, um, you're, are you ba- still, are you based in St. Louis? Yes. Yeah. I'm in St. Louis. Nice. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah. It's awesome to meet you, man. You're a fucking legend. <laughs> Go on, tell me more. <laughs> I, I, I love everything you do, man. I love watching it all. I love seeing it all. How did how did we um, originally connect? Your audio is fine on my side. Okay, honestly, yeah. I don't even remember. I don't even know. I think just like randomly, I saw you liked one of my posts or something, and then you know, you shot, we started talking. Shot me a DM, and I was like, "Wow, I don't, yeah, I don't even know how this happened, but this is cool." Yeah, so so it's it's kind of like. Most of my podcasts are with people who, you know, teach hand to hand or teach gunfighting or knife fighting. And uh, so this is this is kind of like, what's he doing? He's interviewing a hockey guy. Yeah. Uh, and and it, what's what's funny is uh, I'm with the whole no fear thing behind, like the essence of no fear is really funny. Is just uh, getting a bite to eat just before. And my my father in law. Uh, was asking me about the origin of no fear. The whole no fear thing is like, you know, was it uh, inspired by somebody, whatever? And I, I said like, and my wife, Jess, made a joke. She says, don't you listen to any of his podcasts? It's like, it was my fear, my whole fear, uh, my whole life as an athlete. I I was always one of the best athletes on whatever team. I gravitated towards solo sports because in my mind, I wanted to be wholly responsible for whether we won or lost. We, we being me. Yeah. So I was playing, you know, tennis, gymnastics, wrestling, whatever, even though I was on teams. Um, but I've always had fear as an athlete, uh, letting down the coach, letting down the team, letting down. And that kind of evolved into the no fear thing. And then the, the natural, my fascination with self-defense was you can't win a fight if you can't manage your fear. Right. Um, and, and so I'm going to magically connect that to you because one of the things, like I follow a lot of different athletes and working protocols, but so why am I why am I inviting Jeff Lavecchio on my thing? You, uh, you're obviously a very good athlete, very disciplined athlete. Uh, you you made it to 
you know, of all the thousands of hockey players in the world, you made it onto professional teams. Uh, and we'll talk about your history and your background in a little bit. But when I started following you, it was I loved your message that you didn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't just, I'm going to just brag about you for a second and then I'll ask you some questions and then you can talk. It, it, like I, like I sent your profile to a bunch of uh, friends, including my son, who's 32, who's a coach trying to make it in LA, which is, which is tough any time of the year, but especially during COVID. Um, b- because there's an energy about what you do. It's not just the fitness and it's not just the, the, you know, so for, for, I guess the first question for you is, is really talk about, is, is there, is there something that you think about or do before you prep a class and how you think about the athletes? Cause everyone's doing the moves, Yep. yep. but there's, there's something different. That's a little contagious in what you're doing. Yeah, well, I think, honestly, I think first and foremost, all of my clients believe me. They, they know that I lived everything that I try and get them to do and everything I try to get them to understand. My whole thing is, like, I wasn't naturally as gifted as a lot of the guys I played with or against, but I still had a pretty good career, and I gave myself a chance playing at the very highest level you possibly can in the world because I gave everything I had in every way I could. And so everyone knows that about me. Like anybody who comes into my gym, they know it right away because they won't be in my gym long if they don't take up that kind of lifestyle, that kind of mantra. Luckily, I'm at a point now where I get to kind of choose who I work with, who works in my gym with me. And so it's just expected on day one. And and when I train younger kids, um, I have to teach them that stuff, obviously. But the first thing we do to start every session after like some warm up stuff is I lay everybody on their back. I play some relaxing songs and I take them through a quick guided visualization. So in my gym, you know, might be able to see it here from where I'm. I got a huge sign up there on the wall. It says, what is your why? And so mm-hmm. when guys before all day long, I'm pointing at the sign, look at the sign, look at the sign, look at the sign, remind yourself, why are you here? Because there's a massive difference for, for anyone doing anything between going through the motions and doing anything with intention. And I learned that through my own career that I watched guys give nine out of 10 and I was giving 10 out of 10. And that's why I was able to leapfrog over guys or get jobs over guys or play longer over guys who were better than me. It was, I would always get 10 out of 10 out of everything I did. And that's, what's going to separate you at the higher levels. Is, was that something you were mentored or you just are a unicorn? Did you always Um, know that? It was a couple of things. One, my dad's an entrepreneur and I watched him grind, started his own business. Like he just grinded really hard, like, you know, go out of town all week long. And I remember, you know, I'd get up on Saturday morning and he'd be outside, you know, doing every chore he possibly needed to do and and turn around, barely sleep, go back out of town again. And it was just like, man, like other people would have relaxed. Like, no, not him. It's like, I will get everything done I need to. So the number one thing was, you know, my dad and my mom was the same. She took care of my sister and I, and she got us everywhere. Like unbelievable. I was very lucky. I have unbelievable parents. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was I realized at a young age, I wasn't good enough, (laughs) like to just like do what everyone else was doing. It was like, Mm -hmm. if I, if I, my parents were like, if you want to be good, like you got to do more. Like you, you, literally you need to do more. My dad's only advice, my entire hockey career, hard work, patience, more hard work. It's all he ever said to me. And so I lived that. And I just started seeing at a young age in seventh grade, when I really got serious, um, I just started seeing that when I did a little bit more and a little bit smarter and a little bit harder, I just started getting better than guys. So that's my life mantra. And that's, that's what I pass on to everyone who works with me, whether it's in person or online. Is, is that the, uh, the inspiration behind your, your GMBM? Yes. Yeah, it stands for give more, be more. I was actually, uh, the first year I was retired from playing, I was with a different supplement company. I'm a first form athlete now, but, um, I was with a different supplement company and they flew me out to, uh, Arizona and my was flight was like the only flight canceled out of like these 3000 people that were at this conference. Right. And I'm, I'm sitting at this like business park oasis that I found in the middle of whatever city I was in. And I just sat there and 
I was thinking about my life and reflecting. The conference was really powerful. There was a lot of people there giving off so much good energy. And I think I've always been that way, but I was like, I can give more. I can give more to everyone else. I can give more to my family. I can give more to my clients. And then just like reflecting on my own life, every time I've given more to anything, hockey, school, relationships, I also always become more. I I get more out of it. And so I looked up the closest tattoo shop. I walked, you know, a couple miles, got it tattooed on me. And, you know, like six months later, a clothing company approached me and said, Hey, you know, we want to send you some stuff. We love your message. They were some veterans. I love working with veterans. Um, and you know, I've had that clothing line now for a couple of years and, and it's just kind of taken off. I, I, I dig it and I love it. You know, it's funny. I was thinking while, while you were talking about your dad and your mom, it's interesting because there are a lot of, a lot of kids that would resent their dad for not being there right Um, right and uh for grinding like that and it's interesting that 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 you saw it and and somehow internalized it as hey uh, there's some something positive about grit and commitment and and uh and and busting your your butt right and it's not like he was gone all the time when i was younger he traveled a lot more as i got older he traveled a, a little bit less um but also, I, I also was able to see because, like, I don't, know, I don't know how much you know about hockey. It's expensive and it's very time consuming. And so, like, because he was because he was an entrepreneur, he set his own schedule. He could work when he wanted, take off when he wanted. So I also got to see that. Yeah, okay. Like he's worked five weeks in a row, grinding so hard. But he also got to take two weeks off and go with me to Canada or go with me to Europe to watch me play or this or that. Wow, so I also great. got to see the fruits of, of what he did. And, and you know, it's not like my family's rich by any means, but like, you know, we didn't we didn't want we didn't want or need for anything. We've had we had a right. great life growing up. So I got to see kind of both sides of that. And uh, and, you know, when they just instilled in me, like in my hockey career, if you it, basically if you give more, you're going to be more. Um, I've just applied that to other things in my life. And it's just like, it works the exact same way. Sports, life, business, relationships, it doesn't matter what it is. Like if I just try and my thing is add value, AAV, always add value to every person I come across, every conversation, it doesn't matter what it is. I want to be a value add to anybody I talk to. Do is, is, is that something that is the best way to, to, to phrase this? Is it a mantra that you say to yourself or you find like, like now your second career is taken off. Right. Right. And, and, and maybe even like, like, like 3.0 is, is speaking, not just the, the training. So you're, you're like, that started to happen. I'm noticing more and more. uh, I think when I first asked you to, um, to, if you'd be interested in coming on know if you're live and you said you said yeah you weren't doing a lot of podcasts and at the time where i didn't see a lot being posted yeah and then all of a sudden you know it just blew up and i was like oh fuck wow look at this but it was all it it, it was all the stuff i wanted to talk to you about about like the mindset and the speaking and the, and the presence and all that yeah i'm so, so i was a captain starting um seventh grade so like sixth grade was my first year of triple a hockey that's the highest level you can play and i was the worst player on the team i played the least amount i barely played my parents were like well if you want this go talk to the coach we don't call coaches you go talk to the coach Hmm. so like they made me do all these things they made me take responsibility i remember when i was like the year before i was in fifth grade i was a good student um, and because I was a good student, they knew that when I, when I got this one bad grade, it was literally because I was being lazy. It wasn't because I wasn't smart enough. It was literally because I was being lazy. So they made me sit out a game and they made me tell all the parents and players why I wasn't playing in that game, like in front of everybody in fifth grade. Hey guys, I, I'm, I'm not allowed to play in this game because I slacked on my homework and I got a bad grade, you know, that type of thing. And that sucked when I was in fifth grade. I thought it was the worst thing ever saying that not being able to play, but like right. that just like beat that responsibility in me, you know? And, and from then it's just, I, I started being a leader after that bad year that I had because I put the work in and from seventh grade on, I just put myself in front of every team. 
It was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a leader in here. I'm going to force myself to do more and bring others with me because I want my team to be better. And also I realized that if I say, if I start calling other guys out, I better be backing it up. Like I better be doing what I'm telling them I want them to do. And so that also kind of pushes me even further. It pushes me harder. It keeps me on the, on the, on the tracks, you know? It's so cool. I think I want to hang up with you and get on a call with your parents. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, the, they're awesome. They're, no, but I'll tell you that, man, like, like, I mean, on most lists, the number one fear for, for people is public speaking, not getting dragged to a secondary crime scene, raped and murdered. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like public speaking that idea of, Hey, we don't call coaches. You want to do something, go talk. You go talk to the teacher. You put yourself out there. Cause there was a, um, uh, you know, Lisa who works behind the scenes, uh, helping put the show together. She sent me a, a, a clip of yours. That was fantastic. You were talking to a, a bunch of, of, uh, hockey players getting ready for some stuff, but you talked about the, um, uh, the idea of standing up, and looking people in the eyes and a firm handshake. And, and, uh, and I remember like, I was like, like, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you and I just did. I go, where did Jeff get that from? Because that's a, an extension of the, of the whole, you know, uh, you know, of the whole mantra uh, of your, um, you know, give more, be more because the I, I remember, you know, one guy is, is one of our top coaches now. This guy Adrian, who um, he's in the army, he's a professional stuntman. He's worked on like like massive, massive like you know A list films, martial artists for years, uh, skydive, parkour, like a stud. Yeah. Um, and several years ago, we're doing one of our combatives camps at in Vegas. And one of my coaches says, uh, this guy, Rick, he pulls me aside. He goes, you know, Adrian's really good. You should you should give him a shot, man. This guy moves really well. And I looked at Rick. I go, which one's Adrian again? Like, here's a guy that's like, he's like part unicorn. Which one's Adrian again? Because that guy there. I go, I've never seen him fucking move or teach. Like, is he a ninja? I've never, I know he's here. I know I've right. seen him, but I've never seen him do anything. And I said to Rick, I said, have him fucking teach something. Because I had a team with me, right? Okay. And next thing I know, uh, he goes, okay, everyone together. Like, there's 80 people at this camp. He goes, Adrian and, and Bill are going to, uh, you know, start. And Adrian starts teaching. And it was like, like angel sounds. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, I, like, I walked up and after I go, dude, fuck. I had no idea what you knew or who you were because you were so polite you stayed in the back. Right. Right. You know, and maybe he's got like he's a sniper and he just doesn't want to be seen. But uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is, you know, if you want to be and this isn't about the ego of being noticed, but if you believe in yourself and this is part of your message, right, because because you love hockey, you're and I want to, I want to talk about the you know, your your, your program Uh because because while you you'll train anybody if you want, like you've got a, a real bias on on it's the hockey mostly team. mostly hockey in you person. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but the end of the day is like whatever role you play in life, there's a moment where you need to be noticed. It could be a date. It could be a bank loan. It could be entrepreneur. It could be. And uh, how you're communicating with somebody and just that lesson that your parents taught you is like, hey, I'm not going to call her and ask you for a date. I'm not going to call, uh, you know, this therapist and say, uh, my son needs to talk to somebody. Yeah. And th I think it's it's massive. And that that little lesson. It's a lot. I mean, it's because it's hard. It's really hard when you're a little kid, third, fourth, fifth grade, whatever it is. Hockey's all you think about. It's all you want to do. And you have to go talk to the coach about like why you're not playing. That's a hard lesson. But what's harder if you zoom out from a 10 foot view to a 10,000 foot view? Do you want your kid not to be able to go in and talk to their boss? Do you right. want your kid not to be able to go in and talk to their college professor when they're having a problem, you know, in class and they can't figure something out? No. But if you're the one who's always talking to the coach, you're robbing your kid of that life skill. 
And unfortunately, you know, I don't know how much you, you dabble in youth sports. The, the professionalization of youth sports has unfortunately kind of rotted everything that I think youth sports were about. And the reason why parents put their kids in youth sports was to teach all these life lessons and how to be a good leader, a good follower, a good teammate, you know, uh, uh, giving more to something, anything like how to dedicate yourself, how to pick yourself up after a loss or after a bad game or after an injury, all these life lessons that sports can teach our kids. And unfortunately, parents are just going like crazy now. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's, we got to get back to that stuff. Like what's the main goal of this? Because right. less than 1% of all kids in all sports are going to ever get paid to play, you know? Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's a, that's a huge message. And, and hopefully you, you get it out more. And then again, through, you know, getting on as many podcasts as you can and getting that, that, that message out there. It's uh, it's huge. Cause I think about, so many of the things that I've accomplished in my career are because you could look at it as like, like, oh my God, how did you have the confidence to go talk to that person? Because who, who, whatever door I opened, there was trepidation and fear. The fear loop is there. It's like, oh shit. And you know, one thing that I was thinking about, if, if you don't go talk to your coach, this is like like a parallel thought. I'll come back to the other thing. If you can't talk to your coach and you're, you develop a codependent relationship with somebody else doing it for you, like you said, the 10,000 becomes 20,000, becomes 30,000. That's going to be how you parent. That's going to be how you deal with your spouse. That's going to be how you deal with... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge lesson. And also, if you are the 1%, or might be, right? Like, like you said, you weren't as gifted as other people. But uh, like I know this: if I see somebody in on my team who's always doing more, who's there early, stays late, always doing more, I'm not even looking at the fact that they were a little bit off balance when they did that kick there. I like this person because I like their work ethic. Absolutely, uh, and and you know, coaches, bosses, whoever they're going to give that person if it comes down to firing day and there's two people and it's between you who's always early, always late, always doing a little bit extra, always trying to add value and somebody else who does none of those things, but your metrics are the same. However, they're grading you. They're always going to take this yeah. person always. The, the you know? and, yeah. And it's that, that those are lessons that sports can teach. And for me, because sports aren't teaching them as much. Uh, luckily, a lot of my guys get that stuff because I only work with like the elite, the elite guys. Um, but it's something I hammer home in here every single day, right. every single like every day. I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care, you know, how many goals you scored last season because it's over. What are you doing right now to better your future self? Like, that's all I care about. Are you are there? Like it, it pisses me off because, you know, you know, I created a program called No Fear Coaches. We'll talk about it another time and another uh, another program called uh, No uh, No Fear Family. And um, and in it is, is this idea of this is so personal to me because I grew up in Canada. I don't know if you knew that. No, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I grew up in Canada and you're either a skier or a skater. And I came from a skiing family. Yeah. And, and so I was a competitive skier and I started skiing like three. You started hockey when you were two. Yep. And, and when I was like 13, there were people going like, if Tony continues on this trajectory, maybe he goes to the Olympics. I mean, he's like a serious skier. Like he's like, and, um, but I never got on the podium. I always wiped out. I always caught a tip. I always skied off. So some people in cycle in the, the psychological circles will go, Oh, you suffered from self-sabotage. And I go, well, but I always showed up. I, I, I crushed it in practice. I just couldn't do something. And if you asked me, uh, like, before a race where you were at, like, if you saw me walking around and everything, you wouldn't go, this guy's scared, this guy's nervous. But my, my mindset during the whole thing was, and I summed it up in, a, in, in, in this one word, 
or one sentence, if I'm so good, why am I so scared? Nobody had ever ex explained to me the butterflies, the sweaty palms, the the uh -huh. pre the, the pre event uh, jitters. No coach, mentor, or family member had ever said, "What are you feeling? What are you thinking?" and and consider this. So I guess one thing that I want to ask you specific to that is, and I'll say the line again for people listening. A lot of people who follow who, who follow our, our messaging have heard me talk about this because to me, a coach is only about inspiring performance. Trainers teach technique and movement. And most coaches are really just trainers. They don't know how to inspire performance, but everyone calls themselves a coach. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's subtle. You, 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 everything I'm, the, the part that excites me about your life and what you're doing is you're, you're coaching, but then you're also saying, Hey guys, I want your knee over your toe like this. I want you on the slant board. You want to look at this mobility shit. You're, you're a trainer, but you're also a coach and that's rare. Talk to me, talk to me about, I'm talking about whatever you want, but Talk to me about fear growing up and performing and, and what type of mentoring or coaching you had around that. Cause that fucked up my career. Yeah. You know what? It's real. It's so interesting because I was a little bit similar when I was younger, I would crush practice and I was really nervous in games, like really nervous to the point where it would affect my play sometimes, not all the time, um, but sometimes. And actually, um, you know, this is also a reason why I, I am the way I am. When I was uh, 18 years old, I was playing junior hockey in Omaha, Nebraska. And right before the season started, the high school guys who were in town, they were already there. And uh, I actually got in a car accident with one of my teammates. Uh, we jumped on the trunk oh, wow. of a yeah, we jumped on the trunk of a car. Our other buddy, our teammate, jumped in and and you know hit the gas a little too hard and. Uh, split second decision. I dug my fingers in like where the trunk meets the car where there's yeah. that like little sliver. I dug my fingers in. I almost fell off and he jumped off. Um, and he, he smacked his head really hard and, uh, he, he wound up dying. He wound up passing away. Jesus. Um, yeah, pr pretty much in my hands. Like I was holding his hand head so it wouldn't hit the concrete and, and all this stuff. But the reason that that was such a pivotal point in my life, number one, that teammate, he was, we were teammates the year before. We were pretty good friends. And he always talked about uh, that he was going to die before 30. Always, like all the time. He was always saying it. I, I'm not going to make 30. I'm not going to make a 30. And sure enough, you know, he died when he was 19 years old. On my, on my 18th birthday, actually. Um, so one, like law of attraction, I was aware of it. Like a long, you know, when I was 18 years old. Because like, man, it's so weird that he always said that. And so... Uh, they brought in the sports psychologist who was like the, I think he was the corn Huskers football sports psychologist. Sports psychology wasn't very big yet. Like it wasn't being talked about. Um, they brought him in to talk to the guys who were at the accident. I was having a lot of trouble sleeping, kind of like some PTSD stuff. I kept seeing it over and over. And he gave me this CD. And on the CD, there were six tracks. The last track was a track to help me fall asleep. It was kind of like hypnosis, visualization, diaphragmatic breathing, all these things. Um, but the first five tracks were um, were tracks that were peak performance, right? And so I started listening for every game. And I got so much – I started playing so much better because mm -hmm. of visualization. I was putting myself in these situations repeatedly before the game so that when I got to the game, it was like I've already been here before. And you didn't have that kind of – lag that one second like of thought it was just like i had already seen myself in these situations so i was just that much quicker so i got into sports psychology at 18 and and that really helped me with exactly what you're talking about kind of the the you're dominating practice but you can't do it all the time in in competitions or games so sports psychology was something that really really helped me with that um and so now in the gym just because of like who I am and how much sports, psycho sports psychology, I did so many things that people used to look at me 10, 15, 20 years ago. And they're like, what the hell is Vex doing before right. games? But it worked again. I wasn't good enough to not do that stuff. Right. So I did it and allowed me to be at the levels I was able to play at with guys better than me. Um, but now I just do that stuff in the gym for my guys every single day. And I make them understand. Cause like, wow. you know, like this, this first group I have, 
I, I think the youngest kid I have is 15 or 16 and, and it'll go up to like 18. So they're still in that age where like working hard, you know, some of their friends might not think it's cool to like work as hard as they do or to visualize or meditate or anything. And I just get in their heads all the time. I'm like, no, no, right. no, you're not cool if you don't do everything you can, because you never want to look back when you're 40 and be like, damn, why didn't I do this? Like, like Jeff said, or why didn't I eat better? Or why didn't I sleep better? Why didn't I listen to him about breathing? You know? So like, that's why I'm so intense on this stuff because I don't want any of my guys or, or anyone in the world um, to have regret. I think it's the worst thing ever. That's wild. And it's, and, and I, I love that, that message. And, uh, was there sports psychology when you were when you were growing up with the skiing? Like, not really. No, yet? no, not at all. I mean, yeah. that, I mean, we're talking about the sixties and seventies. Yeah, that's yeah. how that's how that's how old I am, man. Like, <laughs> do you we, teach? You look young. You look younger than that. So hell yeah. Thank you. Are you hitting um, on me? Yeah, <laughs> I got a fiance, bro. I'm good. Okay. Um, do you do you do you teach visualization with like fighting? Is that something guys do to like? visualize where what you're going to do and is that something I, I do i do some very very interesting creative stuff uh and i teach four times a week live on zoom now uh um but we've always done very cool innovative drills in fact in the 80s uh there was a guy i met I don't know if it was through self-defense or whatever, but he happened to be a sports psychologist, which was really rare then. And he introduced me to the, the, the concept of metacognition, which paraphrases, like, how do you think about thinking? And I was always nerdy into, into like zen stuff and, and, you know, being a Bruce Lee junkie, like every martial artist was. And Bruce Lee was into, into, um, you know, uh, 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 Zen and Alan Watts and things like that. And some of it was trendy and cool, but every, every so often, you know, you'd read something like Alan Watts said, if you can't meditate in a boiler room, you just can't meditate. And you'd hear that and you go, what the fuck does that mean? Cause everyone meditates in like, when you meditate at your, at your, at your gym, maybe you close the lights, everyone's quiet You tell everyone, but if they can't get into the zone in a screaming arena, with fans booing them, then maybe the meditation. So the the boiler the boiler room was like like take your guys out one day to meditate at a uh, like a, a children's bounce house where yeah <laughs> you know, yeah a birthday party screaming and right going, and but the idea is like I started going like wow you know you don't have time to get ready to get ready for a sudden ambush and yeah. so. So yeah, we we include a lot of uh, visualization, but not in the traditional sense. Yeah, yeah. But we explain it that if I practice something in my mind enough, there's enough research out there, some famous studies, the basketball study, and all this that, that I use that all the time in my you, speeches. You, you know, and so you go well. If this group that never touched a basketball can improve within one percent of the group that did then visualizations is the, um that's that might be the biggest rele revelation i've ever learned that like what came out of that study and like i don't remember when that study was i mean it, it was a while ago but it wasn't yeah. that long ago i believe I think it was 80s or 90s okay so it was so i was using that when i was playing like to teach to tell people like why am i doing this stuff and, and right. that was the reason and like i'm telling you i'm telling you i scored so many goals when i started playing over in europe overseas um, after my, th I had 14 concussions in my career, unfortunately, um, you know, really changed kind of the trajectory of my or career. Fights but, or, or fights or big hits into the glass? Uh, ma mainly like hits, like, or puck, I, you know, pucks to the face. I had a couple, I had my lip, you know, slap shot, knock me out, uh, split my lip open. The one that hit I'll me here. It. Uh, yeah, I had a couple, I had one where I got elbowed to the back of the head. I didn't see come in. Like there's just a bunch where. I couldn't really do anything, you know, it wasn't like it was, it was something I did wrong. Like I couldn't see the puck coming 80 miles an hour that was going to hit me in the face. So, um, I had a couple from fights, but, um, yeah, when I, when I started visualizing, man, everything changed. The game came so much easier to me and every, you know, I've trained thousands of athletes now over the last 11 years, uh, going on, go, going on 12 and, and they all say the same thing. Like, it's a massive game changer once they start to kind of feel the rhythm of it.
did you did you ever uh, on a similar topic, but but a, but a pivot? I watched a, uh, a sports documentary, and one of the people they interviewed was somebody you probably never heard of him, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, they uh, he talked about an exercise that he intuited, you know, where if if this was he'd have a piece of paper, and he had a. Did you ever see this documentary? Where I, he talked I, about. Are you talking about where the puck was all the time? Yeah, and he would watch the game, and he would draw almost like etch a sketch. Yep. And, but what he was doing, like I look at that as 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 he was uh, creating an additional metacognitive link between what his what he was visualizing and what he could see on the ice, and then he, he was like the neural patterns and this this like really esoteric. They probably neuroscience can't even explain what he was doing in the in the truest sense. But, but I, I, what I tell people in, when we do visualization in self-defense, we do everything from energetically, what did you feel? Every victim of violence, every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. So the, the first bad feeling starts with, or the first pre-contact cue is like, I got a bad feeling about this place or this person or this thing. If you don't start to think strategically there, you're getting closer to the fucking kill zone. Right. Uh, and and so, so what I look at with the, with the Gretzky thing is him doing that and then looking down and seeing it and going, okay. And he, what he was doing he was, of course, you know this, but for everyone listening, he was drawing on the paper the movement of the hockey player moving the puck, passing the puck. And the connection he was making was – he was programming in his brain like artificial intelligence, but 40 years before AI, where this player liked to move, how this player liked to skate, how this player liked to pass. And I remember that sports psychologist in the 80s was talking about Gretzky. He said, if you watch Gretzky on the bench sipping water, he says the other players, this is very subtle. I don't know if you ever heard this. Oh. He says the other players would be like this, like looking down. <sighs> Looking like this, you ever see this on a bench? Hey, did you get laid last night? Hey, <laughs> right, that's probably what they were saying, <laughs> right? But Gretzky would always be like this, head up, drinking like this. He never took his eyes off the game, yeah, right? Yeah, and and the idea was he was always what he was doing on the paper, he was doing on the game. So, here's what I tell my my and most of the people listening to this, uh, hopefully, they're being inspired by you, but. Most of you listening to this are into the self-defense, martial art, combatives, DT side, because that's obviously where my biggest audience is. Um, but you've all heard me say, if you improve your perception speed, you improve your reaction time. If you want to be a fucking faster athlete, you don't. it's not fast twitch muscle fibers and running. That's a small part of it. It's can you improve your mind speed? How do you improve how quickly you think? Process of stimulus, refractory delay between stimulus response. It's all mind speed and all these little things. The, so we do all that shit. We have our own version of the Gretzky game. Um, we do whiteboard shit. What would you do here and all that? But it's it's this line. And, and it's the same thing. If you can get your athletes to improve their perception speed before they're on the ice, they can improve their reaction time. So they're already intercepting a, a like that pass three slides three three strides before because they know what this player is going to do exactly their, their anticipatory cells are fucking so dialed in and and you know i'm sure it's i would assume it's got to be the same with fighters but the best athletes in any sport have the best anticipatory skills like you said they can anticipate things like they're moving before they before anybody else knows where the ball is going where the puck is going right. they're already on their way there like it, they just they think things like a second faster and a second doesn't seem like a lot if you're in a fight that's a whole lot of time it's a lot so when people ask me to explain how to develop this and I want to bring this back to kind of your life story where you went like I didn't have the gifts that other athletes had so I had to work harder so when when you look at let's say uh a Muhammad Ali or a John Jones or like like whoever your favorite fighter is and they're moving differently than you or they're reading things and some people are fucking unicorns and you can't you know everyone understood Mike Tyson's TikTok 
but nobody was able to replicate it and become heavyweight champion. And so, so it was something that Customato developed just for Tyson based on Tyson's psychology, his body type, his, and all that stuff. And so even though people knew what it was, almost nobody could beat him and nobody, nobody took that and turned it into a style like there are martial arts styles. So what I want to say to all the people listening here, we call this the three eyes: instincts, intuition, and intelligence. That that when you start doing other things, like you should be doing, uh, my, I just had my, my my buddy Marco Lala, uh, uh, an OG martial arts guy, on on the show last week, and he said in the eighties, you know, he was big on on conditioning as a martial artist, and one of his lines was, "You can't fake endurance," and I always fucking loved that, right? Because, to you know, like you think about Lombardi's greatest, well, he's got a great quotes, but his fatigue makes cowards of us all. I can say, Jeff, you know, I'll get you on the ice and I'll skate circles around you and this and that. But when my legs are tired and they weigh 50 pounds or I'm scared and your legs feel like they weigh 50 pounds, you can't fake stamina and endurance, motherfucker. 100%. You know? that's, that's so true. Wow, I love that. You can't fake endurance. That well, is a, that's a great quote. It's, 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 it's epic. But so like, so guys, everyone's doing that. Jeff's doing that with all his athletes doing like crazy disciplined uh, conditioning and, 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 and new shit. Like I look at now some of the stuff that you guys are doing, you started working with the body flow stuff and moving yeah. around. Yeah. You, you had to be thinking, fuck, if I'd been doing this 20 years ago, oh God, I think injuries, back pain, knees, Every every off season, there every you know every time I learn something new and I'm starting to apply it, I'm like, God, you guys have no idea how good I would have been if I'd have been doing this, right? You know, like like the training that I did hurt my body. Like it it helped right. obviously, but it also hurt at a, at a you know maybe like a paralleled level. Whereas if I'd have been training smarter and and just in you know I I. I been on your website and I've watched a ton of your videos and I dove deep into your Instagram. Like when we first started talking and you know, similar mindset, like, like it's, you, you could train a fighter and, and lift weights only, and they're going to get stronger, but does like that fully translate to fighting? Like, no, like it doesn't fully translate. So there, is there a better way? And you're a guy who's like constantly looking for a better way. And that's right. me. Like what's it, how can I get one more percent better? How can I get one more percent better in all these different areas? And for me, it's it, thinking outside the box, you know, trial and error, trying things. It's, it's super important to get uncomfortable. Yeah. The, uh, there, was one, there was one line I heard that, I don't know, it was sometime in the 80s when I first heard it. Uh, it was the mind navigates the body. And there was something... There was something very profound in it, even though I didn't fully understand it, but I understood it enough that, you know, here are years later and, and like everything we do starts with understanding how I think affects how I feel, how I feel affects how I think both influence how and when I move. That's kind of spiritual, metaphysical. But then we go, hey, the mind navigates the body at a neuroscience level. The way you educate your your neurons, the signal speed is going to determine whether you practice properly or not. So, like you said, the 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 guy that's one second faster in decision making, he's the guy that hit that right that check or got the break breakaway, or the goalie that cut the angle because he's reading all these other nuances. I, guys, I can't I can't if if you're listening to probably the most important message from Jeff uh, is it, it's actually, it's actually part of your, it's, it's hidden inside of your mantra, just your t-shirt, your, your apparel line of give more, be more. It's also squeezing that little bit more out of your brain, your capacity. And how do you, how do you educate anticipatory cells? How do you improve your perception speed? And you, as an athlete and as a business person, as a father, as a mother, you got to be asking those questions, right, and all the time. And it's a lot of just doing things with intention. Like, and and I, yeah, I'm not a big fan of people who say 110. percent I don't. That's for me. I'm like, that's not a thing. There's a hundred. 
And a lot of people <laughs> say a hundred and because there's only, you can't get more than a hundred. Right. Uh, it's like, you can't go more than infinity. You can't do infinity times one. No, there's only infinity. There's only a right. hundred. And the thing is most people, they don't have the mental fortitude to get anywhere near their 100. So when they have a great performance, even they think that's their 100. It's like, well, that's actually even your 90. Like you, you're right. living at 80 or you're living at 70. So when you hit 80 or 90, you're like, oh, my God, I have this crazy thing. It's like, well, no, you just played like how you, you could. It doesn't mean you always do. And so for me, the, the, the literally the biggest difference in everything in life that I witness, sports, training, mindset, business life it's intention it's intention if a hundred percent intention will get you more results and i can't believe that you said you love that that phrase because my phrase that i use is the exact same slightly different wording i say where the mind goes energy flows mm. you know what if it's positive it's gonna be positive if it's a hundred you're gonna go a hundred but if it's not you're definitely not and you're not gonna get the most out of it you know is it that's fascinating and it's it's funny because while you were while you were explaining that like there are so many little maxims and, and, and concepts and thoughts uh, that uh, that we use that are that are like like almost almost like, you know, if we were Siamese twins creating a program, but you I was going, hey, man, we're attached here. We're going to teach you. We're going to create a fighting program. And you go, I like hockey. Fuck you. Yeah, but <laughs> there's there's fighting and hockey. Maybe we could come together as the speaking of which re really, really funny. Um, in the 80s, I got contacted by uh, one of the coaches from the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, that's awesome. And, and he wanted me to, and that was like, that was like, like the 70s and 80s was the Boston, Montreal, like the, you, you know, that, that was the golden era. Yeah. One of my there. coaches played for Boston. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, um, but he wanted me to, I was always, I was always a very, I wasn't a street fighter. I, I wasn't like, you know, I was like about avoidance and de-escalation and we trained hard because I never wanted to lose, but we weren't one of the knuckle dragging. Let's go like all of that. Uh, I just saw, and I'm not going to mention the name because they're pretty famous and, and well known, but it was like a video of them doing a self-defense thing. And I remember I watched it and I watched it twice. I watched it three times and it was pretty good what they're doing, but the negative, the energy was so dark and negative. I was like, I don't even want to be around that. I don't want to yeah. share it on my, on my, on my story. Cause it was just this, it was like, like the Cobra Kai in karate kid. Right. But, but not like a kid's movie. It was like, right. This is how these guys really think and live. Anyways, I digress. So, so the, uh, the, the, uh, one of the, um, the coaches, from the Canadian says, Hey, we heard about you from one of their strength coaches who, who knew, knew of me. And he said, we, we want to send a couple of guys to learn how to fight. And I said, I got to think about that. And this is like the Canadians calling me, right? Yeah, I, was, big time. I, was, I was morally ethically like it was an affront man. Cause I was like, like, I don't want to teach guys how to fight. Cause if I do something to fight, they're going to fuck somebody up. And I don't want to fuck up another athlete. And I understand guys get in a fight. And they called me again. And we had a talk. And they said, well, what's your hesitation? Like, we're like, it's the Montreal Canadiens calling you. And I was like, I said, like, I, like I, it feels dirty. It feels wrong. And he said, look, you know, and he explained to me very politely. And you'll have a good laugh at this. He says, like, these guys aren't on the team to score goals. They're not that good. Nope. They're there to draw penalties. And I was like, it never, <laughs> that's their job is to get into fights. So right. if, if, if you don't want to help us, we'll go somewhere else. We're just calling yeah. you. And I said, and I remember talking to somebody going, well, maybe I can teach them to protect themselves. Like I changed it in yeah. my mind. Yeah. 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 And what was so cool is I did, it was just two guys uh, that they, they came in and I had them come in. They said, they, they came in, got on the phone. I said, guys, I want you to come in. I want you to bring your skates. And they go, skates. We're like, we're coming to like a fight gym. I said, and one of them said, like, do you have ice? I go, no, just bring your fucking skates. And I took, you know, the uh, the big thick mats that you find like horse stall mats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought a couple of those. I put them around a heavy bag. I had them put their skates on so they could stand on the hard rubber mat. And then I tied rope 
to the bag and they had to grab the bag like yep. that and to yank it. And I was teaching them on their skates out of friggin' fire. It was crazy. Anyways, that's nothing to so do with awesome. our time. Yeah, but that's it, so awesome. I figured that's you would so, take that as a yeah, hockey player. It's, it's great. You know, it's not as much a part of the game. Like they're kind of trying to get rid of it, you know, uh, it, but like, I took boxing lessons after my first year of juniors and the amount of confidence that I gained. And I wasn't a fighter. I didn't fight a ton. I did fight, but like not a ton, especially once I started getting my concussions, but like the amount of confidence you get just from like knowing, okay, like I at least know how to defend myself. Like maybe I'm not going to beat up the toughest guys on the ice, but like if somebody goes me, like I know what I'm doing and, and, and I'm confident. It's, it's, it's very empowering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but knowing I like, I also think, you know, I think it's a guy thing genetically, but I would like to think it's a human. I like I use phrasing like we are human weapons and and we need to understand our human weapon capacity and potential. And and everyone, male or female, has the, the, the right to defend themselves, of course. But, you know, Victorian values and social conditioning and and, and certainly the last few decades of, you know, what what they've done even even to masculinity you know i mean you're you're a toxic male dude i know i am <laughs> right you know you you're in shape you're confident you you teach people to go after shit i mean that's i open that's, doors for women i'm a toxic horrible. male man. me too it's man a bad so, world holding doors open yeah yeah so the uh it's 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 crazy um I lost my train of thought. I was going to ask you something, something really interesting there. And I lost my train of thought because I'm reading a crazy long, let's do a quick pivot here um, and see if you can help me answer this guy. Michael Warren asked this question online here. Um, I'll let you read that um, guys. I'll read it for everybody who's on, on uh, not on video. Uh, Cause this, this goes out on, on uh, um, Apple and Spotify just as an audio as well. Guys, uh, Michael Warren says, guys, I, I totally relate to the mentality of success relating to positive thinking, neural feedback advantage. Would you please apply your skill set to technology transfer theater? I believe we can address this challenge with your uh, uh, organic methodology. My reading is horrible today. In order to overcome the obstacles of current DOD entrenched methodology, which slows down and prevents velocity of cutting edge innovation to the warrior. Michael, holy shit. Um, yeah, you got to define technology transfer theater to me. Yeah, um, and if you're still there, I, I, I'm trying to summarize this in my mind, and I probably should have read it a couple more times because I don't have a good answer, Michael, and I don't know that I don't know if there's a way to ask you to explain it better. Um, and what I'm what I'm thinking here is is simply this. So we have a gunfighting course, but it's not a shooting course. The assumption when you go to our gunfighting course is that you know how to shoot. In other words, the technology transfer is, is this, I can push this button and do this. I can have this drone do this. This I'm interpreting this. I might be way off offline here. Um, it's like artificial intelligence doing stuff but my whole thing is instincts, intuition, intelligence. Can I trust my hardwired instincts? Can I listen to and interpret my intuition? And the way we explain it is when I blend instincts and intuition and I use that to create my next decision, that's intelligence. And so I look at any... Uh, technology that I've given, I want to understand like your big sign, Jeff, what's your why? Why am I in this radar room? Why do I have this weapon in my hand? Why am I moving here and doing that? If I understand what's my why, then it's me actually manipulating uh, this, this technology uh, as opposed to, and there's an old expression uh, that a guy from uh, British SAS uh, shared with me years ago when I was training some army dudes in the UK and all technology is always developing faster than we can train people. And so people aren't being taught. Uh, they're not being taught to 
kind of what your message is about when you're talking about how kids like the professionalization of amateur sports. It's like this guy might be a unicorn. He might be worth a billion dollars. We got to get him doing this. And you coddle him and you protect him. He's not becoming a he or she's not becoming a good person per se in terms of the organic evolution. We're just interested in them as a racehorse. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you're kind of like playing, using them like with a remote control versus them making their right. own decisions. Right. And so Michael, maybe I'm way offline here, but it's this whole idea of if, if we teach people how to be good people and then we augment like that goodness with a skill set, even if it's a firearm or even if it's, you know, artificial and like a lot of people are panicking about the chat GPT, right. And the artificial intelligence. Well, if you're a scumbag, you're going to use it. You know, I've used it and tested it where I'm like frustrated, but like I'm so subjective. I'm trying to rewrite a part of my website. I copied it, put it into chat GPT. It's my words. I go, Hey, it's me. It's Tony. Make, make this more user friendly. I'm too nerdy. And it comes out with something that like is more eighth grade. And I go, fuck, this is great. But it was, it was my, right. Like it was like, I don't need an ad to sell to me. I'm the owner of the company. Right. I like using words like pedantic and obsequious, <laughs> but nobody's gonna fucking buy shit with those words, right? Right, right. Oh, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great coaching little nugget right there too. Something that I've learned. I use like a lot of funny cues in the gym because I've found that like funny cues everyone remembers. If I say break a pencil between your butt cheeks when they're doing a plank so that they have their glutes involved in the plank, which cr- yes. increases stability, they all remember that. Right. Or, or like there's a hundred dollar bill between your cheeks. Don't lose it. The wind's blowing like they get that, you know, versus me saying, you know, anterior anteriorly tilt your pelvis and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Like nobody, a, right. nobody, nobody resonates with that. You know, you yeah. got to dumb it down. I, I dig that. And your sense of humor is great. And I love that you 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 keep it in your videos. You're not, you know, I'm me. I'm yeah, me. Yeah. I Cancel dig me that. if you want. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to be mindful of your time. Usually these are 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes we go an hour and a half. What, what's, what's your hard uh, stop? I got about 10 to 12 more minutes if that's okay. cool with you. So, so, so let's do this. Um, um, Michael message me offline. If I didn't even come close to that uh, on that answer. Um, I just want to scan here and make some notes. You're a passionate athlete and, and, you do all the stuff that you tell people to do. Like you're not sitting on a chair going, you know, guys, check out this YouTube, you know, like <laughs> you, 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 you do it. But here's a question. When did you realize or have you realized that you're a better coach than you are an athlete? And that doesn't mean you're not a world-class athlete. Oh, but- oh yeah. I realized that pretty quick. Uh, better coach than athlete i'd probably say it 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 honestly my first couple years coaching my first year i sucked reflection thought i was good because i knew a lot but because you were a trainer then you weren't a coach yet yeah exactly and I, i so i started my company after my third year pro i played 10 years so i would only come home from wherever i was playing whether it was in the u.s or overseas i would come home and uh, I would start my company up. And then when I'd leave three to four months, five months later, however long my off season was, I'd shut it down until the next off season. And I look back to how I was coaching in the beginning and I was absolutely embarrassing. I was using, like I just said, like things that I knew made sense, but it didn't make sense to the couple of clients I had. I had right. very few clients when I started, I had to build my business up from scratch. Um, so I'd probably say around year, I'd say year three is when I realized holy shit, I can help a lot of people, especially back then it was only hockey. And I was, holy shit. Cause the couple of kids that I did have got so much better right. over the course of the summer, uh, from not just physically, but also, like I said, I try and constantly incorporate like mindset mentality, just like how you should live. If you want to achieve a goal, not if you kind of want to achieve a goal, if you tell me you want to achieve blank, I'm going to give you a roadmap of, a way that will definitely make you more successful, get you closer to that goal than the way you're living now. There's zero doubt in my mind. And then it's kind of up to them to to execute on that. So I'd probably say like year two or three, um, but like for sure better than my career, like I can help like guys make, making a million go to like 3 million. 
um, that was probably like year five. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's interesting. Um, like it's not a, it's, it's, it's like another chapter where some people might go, fuck, I didn't make it. I guess I'll do this. Um, and, and I use this example here, guys, you know, at the time that I did, that I came up with this concept, uh, there were something like 16,000 pro boxers in the U S registered pro boxers. And I said, this is very controversial and, and irritating to some people, but I would ask them, I go, there's 16,000 pro boxers at this time. This is like 20 years ago. I don't know what it is now. Registered people who uh, fight. And, uh, I said, name 10. And most people couldn't name, right? You would name Marvin Hagler or Hearns or Leonard, like whoever the top three, four. But you couldn't even name number three or four in another division. And, and I remember saying, why don't more boxers make it? Because they all have coaches in gyms. And it, this is when I was mentoring coaches, which I still do. That's my main thing is like train trainers. And I tell them, you're going to get this trainer designation, but you don't want to be a trainer. Trainers like move, like here's a hook grip. Here's put your feet like this, try and go a little bit wider, run, you know, run faster. Right. And I, 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 years ago, I said, you know, like coaching isn't cheerleading, screaming at someone, come on, man, you got it. Give me 110%. There's no such thing as 110%. Right. <laughs> right? It's, it's, I, I, would, I tell people coaching isn't cheerleading. Coaching is understanding fear and psychology because the only thing that's holding back an athlete is what they're not telling you in their mind, which comes back full circle to what your parents did. And what I, what I think is one of your most important messages is you need to develop the emotional, psychological posture to stand up for yourself. Yes. And what this boxing thing is, is I said, here's my theory on why more boxers don't make it. Because we only know the top two or three in the division we follow, but we don't know a lot of other people. I said, because they're being trained by boxers who didn't make it. Mm. So the same mindset that didn't have them make it is being shared in the gym. Yep. There's a different level of work ethic. So I think it's interesting here because there were people that could say, Jeff, well, you didn't make it. Well, no, you did. You played professional on teams all over the world, but you realized somewhere, and that's why I think you're, you're happy and you're effective and you're successful because I realized for me, I, there, I love when people's face lights up when I teach them that they can protect themselves. I love that more than anything. Yeah. I love that more than the time I lost a fight. And I love that more than the time I won a fight. Right. Right. It's very similar to me when I, when I can help someone else. So, so what, what happened in my career quickly synopsis. So I was playing for Western Michigan university. Um, I was one of the last guys to get my scholarship, you know, obviously uh, I go in there. I play the most as a freshman on the team as a forward, like the most, uh, despite being the, one of the last guys picked. Uh, the team and the coaches unanimously voted me the captain as a sophomore. And like, you know, in hockey, that's almost always a senior. And, and I was a sophomore. So, um, you know, like I said, leadership and all that. I had opportunities to sign and leave school after my sophomore year in the NHL, which I, reflecting back, I probably should have decided to stay one more year and try and help the university keep going in the right direction because we had a great year. Um, so after my junior year, I signed with the Boston Bruins. I leave school early. I do really well at the end of the season playing for their AHL team for a couple months. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to play in the NHL, blah, blah, blah. I come home. First time I'm skating a couple months later, I fall into the boards going full speed. Uh, I was unconscious. You know, I lost 12 to 24 hours of my memory. I was mangled for like, you know, I didn't play hockey game again for 15 months. Thought wow. my career was over, like all this stuff. Um, and, and so going through that and, and, turning down a huge insurance payout to just even try to play again. Like I'll never be covered for concussions again. If I turn down this insurance payout, um, which I did, cause I was like, <laughs> just getting one game. Like I worked my whole life, uh, one game, right. it's all I want, you know? And uh, luckily I got to play nine more years, but, but what that fueled in me was like, 
I never got to ultimately like lit. Like I wanted to make $10 million play in the NHL for 10 years. You know, I didn't get to do that. Um, I got to have a great career compared to 99.9% of other people, but I didn't get to achieve my ultimate goals. I think a lot of people look back on those situations and they turn to drugs or alcohol and regret and poor me and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I look at it the opposite way. Like I'm so proud of what I was able to accomplish. Right. Obviously I didn't accomplish my ultimate goal, but you know, life happened, shit happened. So now for me, anytime I can help anyone achieve any goal, it, it fills this hole in me where like I didn't get to achieve my ultimate goal. So every time I help anyone achieve anything, mm -hmm. whether that's in an entrepreneurial journey, cause you know, I coach coaches too. Um, or if it's, you know, getting one of my guys, a bigger contract or making a team or scoring the amount of points that they, they wanted to score this next season. Like that's the shit that, that lights me up. That's, that's what I live for, uh, helping people reach their goals. And that, that's everything to me. Yeah. And I'm glad you picked up on what I was, I was getting at there. Yeah. Yeah. There I, I totally that, know what you're saying. It's, yeah. it's, uh, and it's kind of addicting, you know, it's, it's really cool to help somebody else achieve something especially if it's something that maybe they didn't think they could or other people didn't think they could. I love that one. Yeah. And th and that's the big push with me with the whole no fear thing is that I realize that any, whatever you want to do, if you can't change your relationship with fear, that's going to change your potential at, at anything you do. So that's our big push. Um, how, but, how much of that too is fear of failure? Like, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing ever. I was talking to somebody today that I'm mentoring about changing careers and, and stuff like that. And, and she's just asking me all these questions on Instagram. And the bottom line was like, you can tell she's afraid to like fail at switching careers and stuff. And I'm like, right. look, like you got, you got to change that mindset because failure, the only, you know, it's cliche. The only failure is not trying. Right. You only live once. You only live once. You're going to be 90 looking back, regretting everything that you didn't try because you were worried about messing up. I mess up every single day. I suck at stuff every day because I know that the sooner I mess up and suck and fail, quote unquote, the sooner I'm going to be better because I'm going to immediately learn how to do it right. a little bit better. And then I'll do it tomorrow and I'll be right. a little bit better, but I'll probably still suck and I'll get a little bit better and a little bit better. And it'll just keep going until all of a sudden I'm nasty at it. Yeah, that's been my life. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Talk to me. What's what's? Do you have like when when fear shows up in your life? Does how fast is the switch? I mean, does it does it does it? Obviously, I mean, this is I you know, like if it's something using what you just said about failure. You know, if there's fear on something that you already have some experience with, you like, come on, man, let's fucking go. Yeah. Um, it's I've always been somebody, especially after my bad concussion, like to start my career, it, I was so grateful to have a second chance. Nobody mm -hmm. thought I was going to play again. I didn't think I was going to play again for like a long time, like nine months. I did nothing. I'd go in the grocery store. I could only be in there four minutes before I'd puke or get lost. Literally, oh, I'd get wow. lost. I could, I could, it was terrible. I was mangled. I saw doctors four to six days a week, every single week for like six to eight months. It was crazy. Oh. Yeah. And like some of the best doctors in the world. Um, and, and so for me, the gratitude, practicing gratitude is massively important because then you get perspective. When you get perspective, mm. you're like, Oh, if I fail at this thing, I'm trying, I can try it again tomorrow and I'll be better. You know? So perspective is everything. Um, but for me, I recently actually read this book called RSF relentless solutions focus. I pump mm. it on every podcast I go on because I love it. I was already living this way but not as intent with as much intention or as mindful of doing it. It was a guy who was a psychologist, sports psychologist for the Cardinals and the MLB when they won the world series in the mid two thousands, I believe. And basically what the book said, the whole book is literally about give yourself 60 seconds when you hit a problem or you're nervous or you have fear about something, you have 60 seconds to like, think about what's one thing I'm going to do right now to make the situation better. And so it's just like immediately one thing. It doesn't have to solve the problem. It's basically like a get the ball rolling type of thing. And ever since I read that book like six or eight months ago, I've been on a whole nother fucking level. So a problem comes my way in daily life. Doesn't matter what it is. Yep. Doesn't matter what it is. And I immediately I'm like, bam, 
what's one thing I can do? And, and my fiance sometimes gets mad at me because ever since I read that book, we'll go on walks and she'll be telling me about problems or something in her business. And, and I'm like, you got 60 seconds, 60 seconds, one thing, one thing, give me one thing, give me one thing. And sometimes she's like, Jeff, females sometimes just want to talk it out. And I'm like, no, that's not how my brain works. Let's make this situation right. better one step right now. So that book has really helped me. And, and, and it's like people are so afraid because whatever the obstacle is that they're afraid of or, or a thing that they're worried about, they see it as this like really long thing where it's like if you just take that first step, it's kind of right. like the snowball at the top of the hill. It seems small, but then that gets you to the next step. And before you know it, that snowball is massive and it's picking up inertia and it's going down the, the mountain and you're golden. You, you're not even thinking about it anymore. It's it's it's. In in that simple example, it's no different than getting out of bed, yeah. doing that first push up, taking that first step, create some momentum. Yep, I love um, it. I love it, dude. Okay, out of respect for your time, I know you got a busy afternoon and stuff like. Dude, it's so good to meet you in person finally. Yeah, um, a, a, an honor. Seriously, an honor. I, I'm a massive proponent for for the military. Everything that I know you do and have done for them is is absolutely amazing. You know, I'm, I, you. I work with veterans every Sunday. Um, every Sunday I donate, you know, an hour of my time, how, however many want to come into my gym. I put them through workouts and stuff. They're, most of them are disabled mentally or physically. Um, and, and I, and because of my PTSD that I had and all my concussions, you know, I kind of, I vibe with that tribe. So I, I appreciate everything you've done for, for America, man, even though you're Canadian, I still like you. I'm American citizen now, dude. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Look at the flag there moved here. I see so it. Um, I, I would like to to uh, give something back to you on on two levels. One, any Sunday, let me know. I'm, I'd love to uh, come on and and do a talk on our fear management. Uh, we do one of, one of my team is a professional psychologist on the East Coast, and he uses our fear management stuff to help vets with PTSD. Oh, that's um, awesome! And and so there's some stuff that we do that's very very effective. Yeah, uh, and all and also uh, any time with your athletes just to give like another, another perspective, as much as they love you hearing another subject matter expert, talk about fear, little light bulb goes off. It just, yeah. it just creates momentum. So just make that, make that happen. And, and I'm happy to donate my time. Dude, to, uh, thank folks. you so much. I, I'll, I'll get all my guys. I train a lot of guys. I'll get them all in this gym. I'll put you on the TV. That'll be sick. Let's do it now. Hell I'm yeah. In. I'm in. Thank okay. Uh, um, is there anything that you, uh, wished I'd asked you that you wanted to talk about? Uh, I guess the only thing I will say, since we're talking about like veterans and stuff like that, I have online training. Um, some of it's for athletes, like hockey players specifically. And then, yeah, I have, I have a, um, an online training team. I just changed the name of it to give more, be more. Um, but it's my own personal workouts. You know, I built it up over the last two years. It started with zero people, obviously. And, and today I think we had 207 or 210 people that are on the team. Nice. Most of the people, there's a lot of people from day one and it's kind of training a little bit more athletically kind of in between media and athletically. It's a good blend. Um, so, and, and any veterans, first responders, teachers, doctors, people like that, um, I give them 50% off for life. And, and if for some reason you lost your job and you're down and you can't afford it, just DM me and I'll give you it for free for life too. Uh, I just want to help that population as much as I can. I love it. I love it. At least let's stick Jeff's uh, website up there. There's information up there, please. So people know where to go. And that's just the, you're mostly on Instagram, right? Yeah. That's Instagram. Right. That's where I push everybody to. I've got a link tree and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else? What else? What else? Um, okay, man. Um, yeah, no, we'll, we'll push that out. I know I've got a lot of, most of our followers are that community. So, uh, Guys, there's so much. I just actually did a, a post on this um, over the weekend that your trained self is always going to be better than your untrained self. And so fucking start training, even no matter where you're at, if you're in shape or out of shape, just you will always be a better version of yourself when you're training. 100%. And, and somebody who's had quite a few traumatic brain injuries and, and a little bit of PTSD and stuff. There's zero doubt in my mind that I'm, when I am taking care of myself physically, I am way better in every single area of my life. It's, it's not the mind and the body are disconnected. They're very much connected. And the more that you show your, your body love, the more your brain's going to love you back. Love it. 
Okay, man. I'm going to let you go. Hang on one second while we uh, while we uh, log off and let the files pop up there. And um, I'll speak to you offline in a sec. Okay, guys, everybody who's listening, um, please uh, share this, tag your friends. Uh, again, we're trying to get more diverse uh, um, guests on here, but you'll see the common thread is people overcoming fear and adversity and, and becoming that best version of themselves, as cliche as that sounds. And um, we'll see you on the next show.